So we have gone through uh, the four fields, four of the five uh, four fields. There's a fifth part, that leadership part in the middle. And uh, that leadership part is so cool. And today, with some of the things we're going over this afternoon is more kind of tools for that leadership circle or tools to help you out and grow in leaders. Um, so it seems like a lot of people got away. All right. That's all right. Um, that's all right. So, I, you know, I don't know if you've thought about this, but we are only here today uh, because of the obedience of people before us. And we are only here today because of, really, if you go back, the obedience of the disciples to go and make disciples. And hopefully you've, you've heard that before. Is it, you know, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for their obedience mm -hmm. to go and share the gospel, to go and multiply their life into others. And uh, I don't know if you've thought about that, but that, that hits me sometimes. It's because of my obedience. Well, I always think Christianity is always one generation from extinction. You know, most religions, you're born into it, so it can go on forever. Uh, but Christianity could really be extinct in one generation if none of us are obedient to the Great Commission. None of us are obedient. Now, God can do some things, and he will do some things. But, but that concept uh, is motivating to me to be active, this idea of making disciples who make disciples. It's like, how can I pass on? I'm only one person. The, the example that Burke gave about uh, how, how quickly we can reach 7 billion. It, you know, it's multiplication is much faster than addition. And what we're talking about, uh, talking about now is raising up leaders because that's really what it takes. You know, we, can, we can go out and reach a lot of people, and, and that's what we want to do. We want to help encourage them and grow them in their faith. But, but really, ultimately, we're trying to see is leaders be developed, servants be developed, and see the process continue. So we're going to talk about that a little bit with a little concept called mall. Because leadership development is, is really, it's tough sometimes, right? Because everyone here is a leader, I would say. You're here. You're, you've decided to be here. You're a leader. Um, you're one who wants to, and probably wants to grow in leaders, in leadership. Um, and and our, our hope is we want to see your life multiplied in others. That's why you're, probably why you're here. Hopefully you've got that. Hey, I want to multiply my life in others. We want to see generational growth. We haven't talked about this. We'll talk, uh, I think Todd, Todd will talk about this. A little bit, but we're really hoping to see generational growth. Groups get started. We're not just adding people to our groups. We start with our group, and we want to, we want to see new groups get started and new groups get started. We don't want to just kind of hey see hey bring get a bunch of people involved in in our group and see it grow bigger and bigger and bigger. That's fine, and that will happen. But ultimately, we see new groups get started and new leaders raised up and disciples make it. And we've talked about this idea of fourth generation, and that's what we're, we're hoping to get to. Todd will probably talk about that. Todd and Tommy will talk about that a little bit more. But I'm talking about how can we do that? How can we raise people up? How can we, uh, it's a good tool to raise up leaders. And we're going to use this concept of mall. Who's heard, who, who, has anyone not heard of mall before? A couple people? Okay, good. Um, so we're going to go through mall. And uh, this, this is also kind of, some people call it the four levels of leadership, I've heard it called. In different ways, and it's a it's an acronym. And the first part of mall is model. Actually, I'll just give them all to you. It's on, it's in your books. If you have your books, the page is called mall. You can turn to that. There's some verses we're gonna look at. It's model, assist, watch, and launch, or some people call it leave. Model, assist, watch, and launch. Model, assist, watch, and launch. Good. Um, so the idea here is we see, if we look at Jesus' life, and we're going to do this, and we look at Paul's life, you can see some things, and, and you've probably seen the last couple of days, of how he raised up leaders. He didn't just kind of, hey, come to a class. It's just like here. It wasn't come for a three-day training, and then you're good. You're good to go. You're a leader now. No, he kind of took them through a process. Um, you can see when Jesus' life, you can all see in process. The first part of that process is model. We're gonna, he modeled for them. Um, we're going to look at a couple of verses. So if you have Bibles, I'm just going to throw them out there. Some will read all the way, some we won't. But um, first one is Matthew 9, 35 to 38. Who wants to read that one for me? Raise your hand real quick. All right, Barbara's got it. And then 1 Corinthians 11, 1 is the other verse. Andrew, okay. So we're going to look at what, is, what do we mean by modeling? Go ahead, Barbara, Matthew. This is Jesus. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. So here Jesus is modeling a heart for the lost. 
He's modeling, like, hey, I, I care about my people. And he asks, he asks his disciples to pray, but you can see his, even his heart to, is to pray for laborers. His heart there. So Jesus modeled for him. And then uh, you see Paul did it say, 1 Corinthians 11, he says, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We want, people, we want to model for the people in our groups. We want to show them the things that we want, to, want them to do, right? If we're not going to do them ourselves, they're not going to do them. I always like to think what we do in uh, moderation, uh, this phrase, what we do in moderation, they'll do in excess. And what I mean by that is if we just, um, well, that kind of works backwards, I guess, in some ways. I don't know. But moderation, if we, uh, if we maybe slack, oh, well, forget the term. It works backwards, I think. I was thinking of a different way. But um, we want to model what, what we want to show them. So, if we're, hey, if we say, like, hey, you should be out in the gospel, but we're never in the gospel, they're never going to be in the gospel. If we say, hey, we should be reading our Bible, but we're never reading the Bible, they're, they're going to do the same. So no, we want to model what's God's heart. We want to model the things we want to do for them. Um, another way you could say model is I do, you watch. So in the first stage, you're going to be doing a lot of things, and they're going to be watching you. And they're going to be picking up. Whether you tell them to watch you or not, they're going to be picking up what you do and follow them. I think new believers especially. Uh, when you're with a new believer, um, they're going to, they come to Christ, they're excited. You know, passion's there. The Holy Spirit's coming to their life. And they're going to like, well, what do they know of Christianity? They're going to know what you do. And whatever you model for them, whatever you encourage them in, that's why we talk about right in the first, very beginning, the first 24, 40 hours, we want to kind of instill a great commission DNA into them because that, that's what's going to kind of pass for them. And so I think about that, not the, I hope that pressure's on you thinking a little bit like in a good way of like, man, I'm their example of Jesus. And what I do, they're going to think is the right thing to do. Hopefully you're doing the right thing, right? Um, so the first phase would be model. The second would be assist. Assist so when you see someone's, you're, someone's watching you, then you see maybe you're developing a leader. You see someone who, who wants to, you're, looks like they're picking up what you're doing and starting to go out and sh- maybe share their faith. They're starting to read their Bible, different things. You want to grow them in leadership by assisting them, helping them join you in what you're doing. This is, uh, I, I like to say, this is we do together. We're going to do some things together. You can see this in Jesus' life and in Paul's life. So Jesus' verses is... Um, it's Mark 6, end of Mark 6. It's actually the feeding of the 5,000. We won't read it, but I think of the feeding of the 5,000, right? Jesus could have got up there and fed all the people. But what did he do? What did he tell the disciples? You feed them. Yeah, he, he told the disciples, you feed them. He, he joined in that process. Obviously, Jesus multiplied the fish, uh, the loaves and the fish, but he included the disciples in that process, and they fed uh, 5,000 that day. And then um, 1 Thessalonians 3, 6. Sorry, that verse. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. Yeah, so here Timothy is the one who's bringing the letter. So Paul writes a lot of letters. Paul and Timothy are doing ministry together. And Paul's using Timothy in that process to help bring these letters back and forth. And um, he's including him in that process. He, he, Timothy and Paul worked together for a while. You'll see later on that Paul finally sends off Timothy. Um, to do ministry. Um, but this first phase, so the first phase model, I do, you watch. Second phase is we do together. And these, both these are, are happening a lot if you think about in your disciple groups and whatever your groups are. Um, maybe when you're going out sharing, you're doing, the uh, first time you're going to model for them how to do things, and then you're going to do it with them. And, and to me, these happen very quickly in, in, a, young, in a believer's life, and especially a young believer. You want to you get them through that assist stage very quickly, and you start do, working together on stuff. Um, I think oftentimes we're like, well, we're gonna, we want them to watch for a long time until they get it down. But I think usually we can hold back. We hold back too long. We can, people can do a lot more than we think they're capable of. So The next phase is watch. Next phase would be watch. And this is you do, I watch. So once someone has maybe come along and they're starting, you're starting to do things together with them, um, they're starting to grow in, in those tasks, eventually you want to go to the next stage of, hey, why don't you do it, and I'm going to watch you do it. Um, I'm going to watch you as you do those things. So two verses come to mind. You see in Jesus' life, John 4, 1 through 2. Who wants that one? John, John 4, chapter, or John, the book of John. Thank you. And 2 Timothy 2, 2. Thanks, Lee. All right, John. So this is Jesus. Uh, yeah, they get this one. I like this one. Jesus knew that the Pharisees had heard when he was winning and baptizing more followers than John was. But Jesus' disciples were really the ones doing the baptizing and not Jesus himself. 
Yeah, so they come and say, it looked like Jesus was started to baptize more than, the, than John, the, John the Baptist was. And people were noticing that. But what did Jesus say? He said, no, it wasn't me. It was my disciples. And Jesus came to the point in the ministry where the disciples were the ones doing the work. Jesus was watching them. Jesus was there. He was watching them, but the disciples were the ones doing the work there. And I think it's great. You know, you think, well, if Jesus was there, you would think he's the one who should be baptizing everyone, right? Like, I don't know, if I was there, I'd want to be baptized by Jesus. Like, if I had a choice, Burke, Jesus, uh, you know, I'm going with Jesus, you know. Um, but no, Jesus was passing that along because he knew that he, Jesus knew, like, hey, I have three years. He knew that. I have these three years to prepare these people to, to carry on Christianity, to carry on my message. And, and he quickly got them involved, and had them watching, helped them, but quickly got them involved in doing the ministry, doing the ministry. What is Paul, uh, this is what Paul says in 2 Timothy? And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So Paul was sharing to Timothy from a distance, right? He wasn't with Timothy anymore at this point. He was shared a letter to Timothy. Say, hey, I'm watching as you, um, actually this might be kind of almost launched probably, but, um, but he said, he pass on the things that I've taught you. Not only to faithful men, but to the ones who will pass on to others. And you see, again, we'll probably talk about that in generational growth, that verse specifically. But, but again, <laughs> sounds like maybe. No. <laughs> um, uh, again, for Paul's watching Timothy. Paul's, he, Timothy was with him for a while, and then he sent him off. And he sent him off. All right, the last phase. So we got modeling. They're watching you. You're assisting. You're doing it together. You're doing things together. They're watching. Then you have them do stuff and uh, you're watching it. A lot of times you kind of give feedback during that process and give feedback. And then launch, the last phase launch. This is what we, we hope to get to. This is probably one of the hardest parts, but this is what we hope to get to is where, where they go and you mentor them. Or they go and you're no longer doing things together. You may not even be in the same city. You may not be in the same small groups anymore. You may not be in the same churches or whatever it is. But the idea here is you're going to launch them off and they're off doing ministry themselves. So two verses. Um, where you see in Jesus' life, when does Jesus launch the disciples? Where do you see that? Great right, Acts. Yeah, it's the Great Commission. He gives the Great Commission. He says, go, therefore, and make disciples. In Acts, he says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. He sends them off. And, then, of course, we have us today because he, he launched the disciples. And then um, Paul. Paul went around on all his journeys, and he, he never stayed anywhere super long. Um, you know, he kept traveling around, kept traveling around. Verse uh, Acts 20 he says that he's leaving the leaders in Miletus. He tells his own, you'll no longer see me. He says, you'll no longer see me. See, Paul had that mindset. You know, it, our tendency is to think, well, I need to keep working with the same person. And I need to, to be here. And a lot of times, honestly, I think we get prideful and say, hey, they're not going to make it without me. Has anyone had that thought before? Maybe they're working with somebody. And, and uh, they're like, man, I, this person's not going to make it without me. I need to be there to help them. I know I've thought that. And, um, and a lot of times, that's not going to get us to reproduction. That's not going to get us where we're seeing this multiplication. We really bring people to a point where we, we launch them. We let them go. Um, they don't even have to be fully ready, even in the process. A lot of times, people uh, are, again, I think people are more ready than we give them credit for. People are more ready. We, we're the ones that usually hold people back in this process. So I, I took you quickly through model, assist, watch, and launch. Does that make sense? Hopefully. So maybe a couple questions. Where do we see this uh, where do we see this process taking place? What are some things that come to mind, you guys? Uh, no, just so you're out doing ministry. Where would you kind of follow, take someone through these through these steps? It should be obvious things here. So, what? Yeah. So discipleship relationships. What do we mean by that? So I think in these groups that we're having, right? We're starting groups. We're starting uh, churches in a lot of times. And to me, this is the, the greatest one of the greatest areas. It's already built into that pattern of care. You know, the first time you get together, you're going to model for them the pattern you want them to do, right? You're going to model for them, what you're, and you're telling them right off that, hey, watch, watch what I'm doing. I almost think the first group, hey, we want to prepare you to be able to do the same thing. So you're modeling them maybe the first week or two, but I'd say quickly, you're going to get them to, to start helping out. And this is where I need to grow, um, is, is I, my tendency is I model for too long. Um, we're just modeling, but we get to a point where you're having new people assist you in the process, when you're doing, walking through the pattern care, say, hey, why don't you do the first section? Or, hey, why don't you, next week you go through uh, the looking back section? Or, hey, why, next week, why don't you help us set goals? And have them assist you in the process. And then, and then after a couple weeks of that, then have them do the whole thing. I've seen groups in Gainesville, the groups that we've seen um, seem like they've picked up uh, quickly 
kind of the, these ideas and these concepts are ones that get to the watch stage much quicker. Um, they get to the watch stage, where they're helping, our, they're there with them, the leaders are with them, but they're helping, they're having their uh, uh, disciples, their new ones come out, they're getting to the stage where they're leading things much sooner uh, and leading things much quicker in the process. May, even after just a, maybe after a month, they're already starting to lead the time and lead the time and making it, making it happen. Of course, feedback's happening and you're following through and things like that. Um, and eventually, they can do a group by themselves. I think most of these groups, are, our hope is they're not dependent on us. If, if they're dependent on us, we're not getting to be a self-feeder. We're not going to see multiplication. They're dependent upon us. And you always, I think, need to have the mindset going into a lot of our groups and even this process, hey, how can I get out? You know, not, not get out in a bad way, like, oh, I'll never see them again. But how can I get to a point where they can do this by themselves? Or how can they do this where they can start others without me? In the beginning, we may help them. We may come along. But we want to have that mindset, how can I see them do this themselves? How can I see them not to be dependent on me, but depend on the Holy Spirit, depend on Jesus in that process? So I think groups, uh, even the practice, right? The practice is built right in. Uh, what it practices a lot of the, the assisting or the watching. Hey, I'm going to watch you do it and give you feedback right now. It's already built into that process to help see that happen. So where else can you, can you kind of see this played out in different things? In our group times, what's another one we've talked about a lot? I'm sorry? Yeah, go and sharing, right? You, t- you know, taking people, so you're, you're meeting with them in a big group. Uh, quickly, you want to get them out sharing, going two by two. And, uh, and you can run through the same exact process. Your, your first time you go out, you model, hey, this is what I want you to do. Take people out. I tell you, hey, I'm going to show you. All you have to do is come and watch. Come and watch. And, and, and I do that maybe one or two times. One or two persons I share with or t- people I talk to. Not one or two, acti- not one or two um, days. But one or two people I talk to. I say, hey, why don't you now, why don't you ask the first question? Why don't you walk up and introduce yourself and say, can we pray for you? And um, we do it together very quickly. And again, we want to get through model assist, I think, much quicker than we think, much quicker than we think. And eventually, hopefully, you have them, hey, why don't you lead the time? And I'm just going to be sitting here watching you do it. I'll help you if you need help. And eventually, you want to launch them and say, hey, those disciples you're working with, you need to take them out now. And then when they come back to your group, say, hey, how'd it go? And you're still giving that feedback. You're never cutting them, up, cutting them off completely, but giving that feedback. So good. Any other, those are the two scenarios I always think about, the quick best place I see this happening. Where else would you see this happening? Wow, it's a dead group. I look around and I see people like I'm tired. I mean, if you got to stand, what the 411? Yeah, and that was that was good. Thank you, Berg. The other is trainings and a 411. This is I I, I appreciate. Um, I think it's taken me a while to to change my ways sometimes and learn some of these new these concepts that are, they're not new. They're they've been around for for thousands of years. Um, but. But new for me in learning how to disciple, how to train. And, and I think one great is, is helping out with trainings. So people that you're working with, maybe you're taking, taking someone along, um, uh, it's a brand new believer, and you've showed them the 411, or you've showed them something, or you've taken them through a couple lessons, have them quickly train someone else. And that's, again, that you're building that in. But maybe you do a church-wide training, or maybe you do a big training, and you're going through a 411, or, or um, whatever your church may call it, maybe a level L1 training. And uh, have younger people come and do the trainings as well and lead in the training. I think that's been so helpful in my growth is, like, I wasn't ready. I felt like a lot of things. But, hey, Justin, why don't you do this part? And people are going to learn so much that way. Uh, but help, but again, same thing. Have them, they've watched you do it. Have them help you do it. Have them, have them do it and you report back. And then they're off doing it themselves. One cool thing would be if, if everybody here should be able to do 411 with someone individually. But what would be great in my mind is you all go back to your churches after this. You go back to maybe your homes or back to people, and you're teaching the 411 in a, even in a teaching format, in a setting that may be more formal, not just casually, but maybe you're just offering this training um, to people and, and then having others do the same. Others do the same. Good. Any trainings? Any other thoughts about where you can mall? Good. Can I suggest something? Yep, I was going to. Yep. Um, what was challenge to me was it's one thing if you model a watch and assist here, but if you start going here to the next generation and you see how they're doing the three-thirds pattern of care, how they're sharing the gospel, 
I mean, so like Tommy and, and Brian and I, we're starting to go out together. You know, Tommy led Brian the Ward, and, and now, you know, so in one sense, you know, uh, but I, when I'm, if they can get me to be quiet, um, you know, I'm watching them to see how they're doing it. And that's a good way to recognize, have I trained Tommy well? It's one thing to kind of show up and kind of watch Tommy. But when I watch who Tommy's training, that gives me a better understanding of how well I've trained. Mm -hmm. So as you start seeing training go on, yes, you want to maul this person, but you really want to maul this person. Because that's a, the best indicator of how well you've trained the, the person between. Does that make sense? And that takes a lot of time. It takes dying to yourself. There's a reason Jesus said, you know, in, in, in John 12, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it will bear much fruit. And so you know, it, it takes a lot more time and effort to start doing this, to start even going sharing the gospel as a trio. Rather than, you know, oh, they'll be, you know, kind of overwhelmed with three. Well, we, we haven't really found that to be the case. But if I can be quiet and just watch, you know, what, you know, then I, I get a better understanding of what's going on. And even like 411 training and just popping in and seeing that. Now, some of you, you've got to see the first, you know, disciple, you know, understood. So and then you get this level. But you want, to, you want to believe in your group that everybody in your group is going to find somebody and start training. But you want to eventually get to that person. And that, that's what I was challenged with, with a guy who's seen, you know, eight, nine, ten generations of, of disciples and groups. He said, Burke, you got to start going to the, your third and fourth generation to see what's really going on. Now, I'm, that's where I'm at. But again, eventually, that's where you want to be so that you see the multiplication and keep going. And I think the idea with that is not that you bypass this guy completely. It's not like, oh, I, I don't trust him. You take him along, and you, you're asking him, how's your, how's your groups going, right? Part of, part of the process and care and, I think, accountability. Beginning accountability, you're asking, like, how's it going, Sharon? How's it going? Who have we seen the Lord? See? And then it's like, hey, how are your groups doing? How are the groups that you've started doing? How are they doing sharing their faith? So you're asking this second, this first generation here how he's doing and then how his mauling is going. And then you go along with him to do that process like Burke was saying. So there's, it's kind of a it's double whammy there because um, you learn so much by showing up. I mean, you can hear what they say, but you show up and it's sometimes completely different. Um, and it, you know what's hard about it is you realize that you're, you're messing up. I remember, uh, not messing up, but forgetting things. I remember talking to a group once that had started, and um, a group of guys that were going along, they were more grad students or graduate students, and they started a new group. A couple months into it, and I asked, hey, how's it going? And I said, How, how's the practice going in your group? And they're like, what? And we had, we had faded in doing practice in our group. We'd gotten through the basics, and we just kind of time always got crunched, and it just, it's what we cut. It's what I cut too many times. And so they weren't doing practice at all in their group. And it was, you know, it was challenging when they said, like, oh, we haven't been doing that. That's right. We should do that. And it was challenging because I realized, well, I hadn't been doing it for them. And that's really a lot of times what happens is not that they don't want to. Uh, maybe sometimes they just need to encourage it. But a lot of times it's because we stopped doing it ourselves. At least that's been it for me. So The other thing that's hard is with the launch, we, we build relationships. You know, we build friendships. And we're, we're, we're running with people, usually the leaders are the ones that come out, the ones that we're running with and we're excited about doing ministry with, doing life with. And sometimes the launch is hard because you've got to let them go. Um, you know, in churches, this is hard for churches. They don't want to let their best go. They, don't, they want to keep, keep people, hey, this is a good person. This is a good labor. I want to, I want to keep them. I want to see them. And re really what, what we want to do is we want to, how can we release, how can we send our best out? Uh, if we want to reach the world, if we want to reach our cities, our, our campuses, we need. how can we get to the point where we're sending our best out into the world to start these groups? And, and that's hard, um, you know, because we're relational people, right? Because they're our friends. We're sending off our best friends sometimes. We're not, we can't always be in the same group together forever. And then you do things that stay connected. Again, launch isn't like we never talk again. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate leadership times we do in our church because we got a lot of people... Some of the people that I've, I've worked with for a while, I don't get to do group with them. I don't get to meet with them weekly anymore. But we still have our leadership times. We come together and we can catch up and things like that. So, so our tendency is not to launch. Our tendency is to keep. You know, we have to fight that in a lot of ways. And we have to say, hey, we want to send off. We want to, we want to bless. We want to 
commission people off to go and, and do the things that God has called us to. Do the things God's called us to. Let's see if I have anything else I want to mention. Any thoughts? Anyone else on the ball? Is it easier to launch if you each week in a vision cast, cast vision, also not just to reach the lost, but to start the yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And I, you know, I think from the beginning, we want to kind of almost remind them, like, hey, I want, we want you to be doing this as well. Hey, we want you to, to learn this story so you can share with others. And not just share the story to bring them here, you know, but slowly you're going to get to the point where, hey, we want to share where you're leading the group. You know, I think going over the pattern of care, you know, after a while, they'll identify it and say, hey, I do this so you can lead your own. So I think the earlier in the process that you share that with people, the better. It's not like all of a sudden there's one group. Uh, one girl I was working with for a semester, I said, hey, next semester I'm going to be leaving. But I, I told them right at the end, like, what, you're leaving us? Like, what? There, it was like, there were, you know, of course, there were friendships and relationships there. But, you know, I, I hadn't prepared them well for me to leave. Um, and I think that we have to, if we, yeah, the sooner we do that and cast that vision, um, it's better. So, so. Malls, a, it's a simple concept to see on paper. You know, I think we all like, oh, that makes sense. I model things, I assist things, I watch it. I want to launch them. But, but how are we doing in that process, making sure we're actually working through those steps, working through that? And I think as, as leaders, how are we asking our, our disciples at how they're doing that process? Again, it's so key to seeing generational growth is if we're mauling people, as Burke said, the, the term there, if you that we're mauling or, or really just part of that discipleship there. So Sound good? Cool. Here's what I want you to do. We're going to take a break in a second, but I want you to share with the person next to you what, what, what is the hardest part for you in mauling, and how can you grow in that? What is something that maybe, or maybe it's a brand new concept for you, and you think, but what is something that jumped out in that idea of maul? It, it, that, like, man, this is where I need stuff, and I need to be stretched in. Or if there's already somebody you're working with, if there's somebody right now you're thinking, oh, man, this person, maybe where are that and there, what's something you can do with them as a, to get to that next step in the mauling process? And again, it's not like black and white sometimes, I understand. But share that, and then you can take a, a few-minute break. When the music stops, make sure you're back. Sound good? Do it. <laughs>